are you at this time of the day? Very busy, very active. Wonderful to be here. We are going to talk about the main trends changing the future of investment. So the key word is future, investment and trends. Just some words about myself. Who am I? My name is Fatoş Karasan. I started my career at Saatçi Saatçi Istanbul, so I'm from the advertising world. I worked in the advertising industry for a long time. I was the CEO of Saatçi's when I left. Now I'm a journalist. I write about marketing and I teach digital marketing at the Bilge University. I have written books on communication, internet, digital marketing and political marketing. We are at the world as you see, as you know, as you feel, we are never offline. But we have to go back to the real world. And I brought you a quote from a very important master from the advertising world. He says, 100 years from now, the idea is still going to be more important. No matter what technology there is, the idea is always going to be important. So can I see the hands? Who has the idea here? Who has the idea? And the others, are you planning to have ideas? Who has the technology? Who uses technology? So technology and ideas are going to come together. Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict future is to create it. So here we have three distingui distinguished guests, our panelists, one entrepreneur, two investors. I'm going to ask them, for instance, I'm going to ask Torsten, he is the creator of the U Noodle platform, CEO and CEO and creator. What happens when you have an idea and when you want to create something? Then Sometimes. I'm going to ask Rüzgar, Rüzgar Barışık, what happens in the investment world? What should, for instance, Torsten do in order to become a big hit globally? And then from Omar Sayad, he knows very well the Turkish uh, industry, Turkish economy and the Turkish scene. He is the managing director for, of, of the Abraj Group for Turkey and Central Asia. So I want to take the pulse. This is my Twitter address. While listening, if you have a question, if you have a remark, please tweet me. I'll try to look at my phone. So we'll start with Torsten. I have your slide here. Was it so. Yeah, we have some, uh, mic, mic, mic is open. Just give, give us an, a normal mic. Yeah, I can just do a yeah. hand mic. Yeah, with the hand mic. All right, guys, can you hear me? Yeah, that sounds better. That sounds better, yes. Um, so thanks for the introduction. And it, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, it is my first time in Istanbul. It's my first time in Turkey. Uh, I live in San Francisco in California. And uh, it is wonderful to see the amount of energy uh, right here in the corner of Europe, there are s there's so much opportunity. So it's been a pleasure to meet uh, a number of you here beforehand. So uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, so, so what is happening? What we is happening? We start with the macro picture. <laughs> we worked together, we rehearsed a bit, and then we kind of divided the topics among ourselves. The first turn is yours. So what is going on on the broader picture? So I wanted to show you guys this slide that you see up here because that's the world that I, that I live in, in in California. And it is one that I think is, has changed so much in the past five years, you know. We're seeing uh, this almost democratization of access to technology where now everyone can build everything. Things are cheaper and faster and for all of some of the reasons we've seen earlier today with some of the, the, the great other speakers, um, it's really, really good for the world. And in some ways, the, the dynamic and the power is shifting out of Silicon Valley and out to the rest of the world that are, that are able to build uh, startup companies. So that trend, I think, is really important. So the main trend is opt optimism. We can be optimistic I and think so. trust our ideas. I would say so, absolutely. I think that's really important. And uh, what about the global uh, picture, Rizgar? Let me Let's see. Thanks, your phone is. Let me test my mic. Your, your mic is, is working. Your mic is okay. working. Yes. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, Ismail Rizgar Barishuk. I um, I work for the investment arm of the World Bank, and I focus on VC investments. I lead our global internet investments. So maybe just picking up from what Torsten was saying, uh, Silicon Valley is the hotbed of technology innovation, and technology means many things there. Now there are some really interesting trends that I want to talk about that are impacting 
the emerging markets, including Turkey, but more broadly in the region. Um, and I think what we're seeing is it's really digital connectivity that is driving the adoption of a lot of technologies. So while Silicon Valley has the luxury of working on a whole vast array of technologies from health to education to going to space, it's really the consumer-facing part that is getting the fastest adoption in the broader world, especially emerging markets. And I just want to kind of highlight a couple of examples to, to drive home the point. There were a lot of slides up here today that you guys have looked at, but there's just a couple of figures that really capture my imagination. So think about Kenya as an emerging market, and we're going to bring this closer to home to Turkey as well. Five years ago, smartphone adoption in Kenya, 5%. Three years from now, who wants to guess the number? 95%. Largest e-commerce player in Kenya. Think about the top products that an e-commerce company in, the, in, in Kenya sells. If you try to guess what the products are, you'd, you'd probably throw out things like mobile phones, TVs, clothing. Not true. Top three items, a 10 kilogram bag of sugar, shampoo, a bag of cement. Overlay those trends. The real need in these markets, the lack of retail infrastructure with the ability to transact payments over your phone. So I think what we need to get comfortable with, and someone else I think mentioned this earlier today, it's equally true in our markets, in Turkey, in the emerging markets, we are going to spend more money on our phone than in all other stores combined. And that's really impacting our markets. Um, so what matters? Because I think we were asked to speak a little bit about what are the investment trends as well. Um, infrastructure matters. The Kenya example is one of mobile infrastructure picking up. Capital also matters. These are businesses we're talking about. A lot of you are entrepreneurs. You can do everything right, but if you don't have the capital, your competitor who has the capital can still get things wrong and have the leeway to overtake you. So money does matter. Pakistan, we're talking about amazing fact, sixth largest country in the world, 200 million people. Do you want to guess how many new economy, how many internet companies have revenues more than $1 million in Pakistan? You can count it on the fingers of one hand. The reason is lack of capital and a very early stage um, infrastructure that is catching up. And I think I'll leave it right there. Uh, I want to leave it on a positive message, and that is the case. A lot of these markets, including Turkey, is behind, but the catch-up is much, much faster. If you look at Turkey in terms of VC ecosystem, in terms of internet, e-commerce, probably 10 years behind America, behind Silicon Valley, the catch-up time is not going to be 10 years. So we're seeing this stuff happening very, very fast. And I think that's one reason why we are paying attention, investors are paying attention, and entrepreneurs should be paying attention. Rüzgar, what do you exactly mean by the infrastructure? Infrastructure of a company or the ecosystem? Uh, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues will have uh, um, thoughts on this as well. But um, it, it's, not, it's not the company and its infrastructure which matters, but it's the ecosystem in ecosystem. which they function. So it's mobile infrastructure. It's taking payments. It's being able to ship stuff from one st um, side of the country to the next. It's, it's those things yeah. as well as the investment ecosystem that really matters. I mean, I'm just following from that string. Uh, you know, we are investors in Hepsi Barada. Our partner was up here earlier today giving you um, more insights into the business. But, uh, you know, one of the key factors that we feel very strongly about e-commerce in Turkey is exactly the factors that Ruzgar mentioned. A, you've got high mobile and internet penetration, so you have customers who can access and gain access to the, to the website and, and transact. How do they transact? There's high credit card penetration, so you've got 75% plus penetration in Turkey, so that makes it easier uh, you know, for customers to transact and, you know, and be a part of this ecosystem. Um, thirdly, it's the logistics. So in Turkey, you can deliver a package from east to west or west to east within two days. So that facilitation of getting that package makes it easier. Because what is e-commerce selling? Convenience to the customer. So you can only facilitate that with these sort of ecosystem enablers, um, which allows you know, players like uh, Hepsi Barada to grow. I mean, for example, if you look at e-commerce in Turkey, it's growing more than 33% per annum. 
And when you look at offliners, they're either shrinking or growing single digit. Um, and there's a long way to go. Um, you know, for example, in Turkey, uh, you know, e-commerce only comprises 1% of total retail. So you just look at any sort of global statistics, whether it's you know, emerging markets or developed markets, those, those do go into the double digits. So the opportunity is immense and, and the potential is, is, is very high. So in developed markets for e-commerce, just to pick up from that last point, is it, is, is it being saturated, the markets, or is there uh, still room for improvement? And um, uh, markets like Turkey, you said <coughs> that we can still expect some booms. Did I understand it correctly? Omar? So, um, you know, if I, I'll talk specifically about Turkey, but, you know, most of the, if you look at since 2010, since 2015, you know, 69 out of 265 of the tech M&A deals have been e-commerce deals. Um, so there's, there is, it's been a very active space. You've seen a lot of investors come in, whether that's financial investors like Abraj, um, or you see strategic investors like Naspers, you know, uh, investing in this economy, because it's, it's really a consumer story. So when you look at Turkey, what excites us as investors is you've got a young population, they're wired, they have the propensity to consume because it's a large middle class, which is growing. You have, you know, you know, high urbanization, so you know, either both parents are working or you, you are working, so convenience is key. You don't have the luxury and time to get stuck in traffic in Istanbul and go and you know, procure things from a mall. People want convenience. Uh, and so that's really sort of you know, going back to what we heard from everybody in, in the, in the uh, earlier panels is you know, center around the customer. That, that's critical because that is what we do every day. How do we make our lives, our customers' lives easier and, and more convenient? Rüzgar, do you see growth for the e-commerce part of the, the startup world? Because I was told that half the audience is from Turkey. So do you see op big opportunities for Turkey in the e-commerce part specifically? Sure, absolutely. So um, again, Silicon Valley takes the lead in, in a lot of these things, a lot of these trends, consumer included. And in the US now, um, of total retail spending, about 15% growing. Um, in the teens uh, is e-commerce and the, the prognosis is that that's going to keep growing uh, significantly as w w with new developments um, in Turkey and in other emerging markets we're at a fraction of that we're at 1% 1.5% 2% it depends on the category I mean who remembers buying a ticket for a plane or a concert in a store I don't certain categories go there very quickly others catch up but in emerging markets, we're way, way behind where the U.S. is. And two things are, are really accelerating the change. So not only is there growth, I think actually the growth may be accelerating in certain segments. One is mobile. It's in your pocket, so you, go, you look at it you know, 15 times a day. It makes you a lot more likely to transact. And the other one is, which I think Omar is getting to, is the importance of logistics. The game changer is when you can get something at your doorstep same day, the game changes. There is really no more reason to go and buy bulk anywhere but online. And so those things are now happening. I'm sure you've tested you know, Amazon or a food delivery same day in San Francisco. That's going to happen in our markets as well. It's, that's, that's the game changer. So there's a lot of growth remaining. So for Turkey, mobile and logistics, two items, I think the, the, the ecosystem and, and is ready. Card, and credit so card. Penetration. Ready to, to boom. What about uh, the, the view from the Silicon Valley? How does it look? Yeah. Um, I was going to joke that in, in, in San Francisco, uh, oftentimes you get to test out all these services and they usually use all their venture dollars and marketing budgets to make sure that it's either f cheap or, or free to do so. So a lot of uh, our, our various basic services we get to have fun with because it's a test bed for the rest of the world uh, and we get a lot of stuff for free, which is kind of fun. Um, no, I think it's, a, it's definitely a fascinating time and, uh, and I think uh, in a very kind of very very broadly speaking right we've had now a, a phase where Silicon Valley has has led the product development uh, cycle in such a way that the products they made they are a master or we are a master of getting the rest of the world to use our products you know an iPhone is an iPhone everywhere you can set the language but it's the same thing and and Google essentially works the same way where we've been great at globalizing and being global from the beginning which is what you've heard a lot here on stage now I think there's gonna be a phase now where products themselves are going to be local. 
and I think therein lies maybe a lot of the opportunity that, that it will be powered by global engines, like some of these large tech companies and some of the up-and-coming companies, but the experience and the products will actually be much more localized and done in partnership with local companies. And I think there's a huge opportunity for a lot of different uh, countries, including Turkey and entrepreneurs in Turkey, to grab that uh, opportunity and, and not try to compete with Apple or Google, but essentially try to build something that fits a local market and ecosystem. It's local needs. Okay, about the future and trends, let's move to the investment part. Early investment level was, was your part, since you are the creator, you are the entrepreneur. Yeah, so, so there's also a lot happening there. Um, I mean, we hear a lot about crowdfunding, and I, I think that that's a, an important topic. Um, you know, the startup world has traditionally been very difficult to make money in. You know, uh, a lot of the startups naturally fail, and for that reason, a lot of the wealth that tied up is, is, is tied up in, let's say, family offices or in larger foundations in a lot of countries uh, are not reaching the startups, and thereby the innovation and the potential of creating tomorrow's economy. Right, and I think that's changing by some of these new vehicles like crowdfunding, and and you know, you have syndicates of of angels where one business angel can invest with another business angel, another business angel, and thereby kind of share the responsibility of developing the company. I think that's really fascinating. A third uh, trend I see is is what I would call challenge-driven innovation, where you uh, as a, let's say, a, a big company or a, a foundation or even government sometimes will offer out a reward, a prize or something for startups to essentially build some sort of innovation. Mm -hmm. And, and that's... Where, where do we see examples? Where right, so, challenge so for instance, uh, uh, in, in my uh, company, Unoodle, we started one last week with, uh, with Amazon that's called the Alexa Prize. And uh, so I don't know if you guys know this, uh, the echo that you can have on your table and you can talk to, uh, and you're talking to Alexa. So the idea is to challenge all of the startups around the world uh, in getting them to build uh, an artificial intelligence robot that can speak to you like a human being for 20 minutes. So you can have a conversation for 20 minutes and they put up two and a half million dollars. So that for a lot of companies, that is your fundraising, or at least one round for you, the, the opportunity to go in and pick some of these challenges. And in return, these large organizations get a lot of uh, new uh, innovation and, and access to new technologies. So there are a lot of these very, very interesting new models that I think benefit a lot of entrepreneurs. So there is a lot to be optimistic about. A lot to be optimistic about, for what sure. What about the venture capital part, this guy? So I guess I was trying to think, you know, what do, we wanna, what do I want to focus on in, in, in this conversation. Um, and it's, it's probably kind of to give you a bit of an overview, an investor's perspective as to what's, what goes on in, in, the, in the venture ecosystem, um, maybe as it relates to Turkey, but also to the broader emerging markets. Um, so we think being an entrepreneur is really hard. It's, it's really, really hard. Um, versus, and then being an investor isn't easy. And if, if we want to you know, prove our worth, we have to work just as hard. But our job at the end of the day really is pattern recognition, right? So an entrepreneur usually works on one startup consequently, you know, in some, in some sequence. They might be onto their second and third, but they're focused on that one. And so the, the range of um, issues and opportunities they, they see tend to be limited to those experiences versus an investor really needs to be able to mine data and look at what patterns emerge. And so what we're seeing is it takes a long time, much longer than anyone anticipates, especially in these markets. Uh, we think we're pretty decent investors, and I think our returns show that. We don't really have startups that get to an exit, that get to where they want to get in less than a decade. I mean, we have a couple that have gotten you know, great and lucky and smart, but it takes a very long time. And at each, step of, at each step of an entrepreneur's evolution, of a company's evolution, the needs change. Certainly the funding needs change. You know, you can start with $50,000 today, but you know, in year eight, if you still need $50,000, you've probably done something you know, not that great. Um, so the magnitude changes, but, but your needs as an entrepreneur also change. And you do need investors who can satisfy all of those needs. And unfortunately, that's one area where the, you know, the region that we live in and the emerging markets are seeing an adjustment. So I think there's a lot of innovation going on at the very early stages. 
So people are you know, experimenting with interesting models, whether that's crowdfunding, angel funds, super angel funds, accelerators, seed incubators. Um, and we see that that part of the ecosystem is here to stay. It finds a way to finance itself, and it adds a lot of value. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I think there is the like, really late stage venture, the growth equity funds, who are established teams who have a lot of experience and who've got some sustainability behind them. And Omar can speak to kind of what their sweet spot is and where they focus. But in the middle, there is a big gap. So you'll, your angel investors will always be around. You will always find someone who's going to give you $50,000, $100,000, $200,000. But once you get to the point where you need a million, a couple million dollars, a few million dollars, which is what happens not just when you try to go global, but even if you want to be a Turkish champion. And there are a lot of Pakistani and Moroccan and Egyptian and Emirati startups here. Even if you never transcend your boundaries, if you're doing your job well, at some point, you will need five, $10 million. There are very few people who scale their businesses to be these big organizations, even in their countries, without raising capital. If you're lucky, you'll do it very late, but most people need it, and there's a big gap there these days. And so what's, that's one thing. That gap has always been there. On top of it, there is a bit of a pullback right now from these markets from an investor st standpoint. The valuations are coming down a bit. The investors aren't as excited to give you another $10 million to get to profitability. So there are a few patterns that are emerging. From an investment standpoint, there is a flight to quality. And what that means is people are being more selective, and they're trying to back entrepreneurs who can be very smart in how they deploy their capital. And if there's a balance between growth and profitability, yes, everybody still wants growth. But the pendulum has changed a bit in the last couple of years. Now, your investors are saying, yes, do go for growth, but not for its own sake. You do need to pay more attention to profitability than they were telling you two, three years ago. So the entrepreneurs who are getting successful and, and raising money in this environment are the ones who are able to deliver on that promise. The good news here is there is no better time than today to be an entrepreneur. And there is no better day than today to build a brand. Just go through a thought exercise, right? The mobile phone, look at your mobile phone, look at your smartphone. All of us have smartphones. How many icons are there? Are there a thousand icons on there? Are there 10 icons on there? No, it's a number somewhere in between. You'll never have a 1,000 companies on your iPhone. You'll have a certain number. Maybe it's 20 for some of us. Maybe it's 100 for others. Those are brands. New brands are getting built. And if you could build, pick something. Pick the Coca-Cola. Pick. If you could build the e-Coca-Cola of 2050, are you going to invest more money to build that today? Or are you going to invest more money in 2050? Every brand that will get built on this ecosystem, which is your smartphone, should be getting built today. And that's why it's a great time to be an entrepreneur, despite all of the challenges. I think I'll, I'll probably Excellent. leave it at that. Excellent. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur. What about on a larger scale, Omar? What is sure. I mean, uh, I'll talk specifically to Turkey, because it's uh, you know, where I'm spending my time and helping to deploy our fund, which is a $500 million fund focused on Turkey. Let me give you a little anecdote, actually. I, you know, so, so Turkey is facing a perception issue, right? You read papers, you read the headlines. It's, it's not positive in all senses. Um, and so I had a large investor, you know, they manage about $200 billion. And they, you know, he called me last week and he said, look, I mean, I'm concerned about Turkey. You know, I'd love to come down, spend a couple of days with you. And then, you know, let's see where we go from there. So I said, absolutely. And he came over the weekend. He spent a couple of days. He spent time in Istanbul. And then uh, we had breakfast in the morning. And he said, you know what? I'm convinced. He said, you know, I hear the news. I hear all the stuff. But you know what? I can see the reality on the ground. Perception is reality. So when you look at Turkey and the opportunity in this market, it's immense. You've got an 80 million, million population. The average age is 30. These people are growing in terms of you know, building a growing middle class. The GDP per capita is high, four times higher than the BRIC average. 
you've got you know uh, urbanization where there's not just an Istanbul story you have you know more than 12 cities with a population of 1 million people then you come to the economic factors you know you've got you know you've got a fact that you know there's you know the current account deficit is relatively in check you know leverage levels are in check you've got inflation in check you've got uh, the currency which has performed fairly well given recent events you know including july 15th you know people were expecting a big shock in the currency and you didn't see that the big movement you saw was in 2014 15 which was largely a global currency crisis not just you know susceptible to to turkey and i come let me come back to one of the topics that you know that that keeps coming up is this fitch rating and and sap uh, snp etc but you know look you have to look at the reality of these things these ratings don't take into account the fact the willingness to pay live example russia defaults on its debt in the late 90s wipes out all its debt comes back to the market and gets its investment grade ra rating earlier than turkey meanwhile turkey goes through a very severe crisis in the early 2000 takes the hard path lives up to its commitments works that debt down and it takes them 11 to 12 years to get back to the investment grade rating and they lose it like this so the willingness to pay is is a key thing so you see all these ratings but you really got to factor them you know behind the other factors in place um what excites us about you know the private equity opportunity well first of all it's heavily underpenetrated i mean in turkey you're looking at 0.04% of gdp is private equity if you look at the brick average it's 0.12 these numbers seem small but they're very significant because you know private equity is starting to gain traction in these markets uh you know for example when i first started you know private equity in turkey it was 2007 my first deal was ajabadem hastana we 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 acquired that group it's had three hospitals um when we exited in 2012 it grew to 13 hospitals so it just shows the immense potential when you take the right partner and help them grow uh you know uh, in, into into the into the local market so the the opportunity is there what has changed is in 2007 the promoters were not that sophisticated um now the promoters are way more sophisticated they're asking better questions they don't want just the money they want to see what you bring to the table what is this sort of approach what we call partnership capital because if it's purely a check we're not the right partner for you and and what that is is you see deals take longer to get done so in when i was in the us and i was working in private equity you'd get a deal done in 6 months a pitch book comes across your deck across your desk the the other side knows what they want you know what you want and you get a deal done here it's about striking a deal striking a partnership so you're going into family businesses it's like you know getting a permanent guest into your house or the way i like to call it is you know it's a marriage with the predetermined conditions of divorce you have to know those conditions what's going to happen in the marriage how you what you're going to do in that marriage and then how you're going to exit that marriage um so it takes a lot of time we really align ourselves and how we do that is create a plan uh you know and and i think one of the things we'll talk about later is is you know how do you how do you create value in these partnerships is focus and priority so that's where we spend a lot of our time up front creating that alignment creating that that prioritization um in terms of you know what we see encouraging trends is lots of strong turkish brands and businesses looking to expand geographically um so there's there's a huge opportunity where turkish brands are looking to do that and it's not just the big names or ulker buys you know united biscuits which is a large you know uk uh, confectionery business i mean you've seen archilic you know acquiring a large business in in pakistan which is a you know white goods manufacturer so you're seeing more and more propensity to you know go outside their borders and be brave um so we find that very encouraging and that's where we bring the value given our network because we're a global private equity player with local presence in each of our markets so that's where we can really contribute and bring value the best thing about the, the startup world is everybody's optimistic you always look at the future always. this is the best <laughs> thing because if you look at the past you can be nostalgic and ha unhappy and you can complain about things but when you look at the future it's always bright in the morning when we talked there were complaints from both sides entrepreneurs complained that the investors were not willing to take risks anymore or the investors are not thinking globally enough so we could be the next facebook why don't they understand us is the complaint from the investors part it's a lack of focus they say you have to be more focused 
to the startup uh, companies or not picking right partners. If you're looking for money, they all said, you will end up not earning money. If you are looking for creating value, adding value, then money comes naturally. So in our last uh, part, please focus on the advice. Like you said, right partner, right focus, uh, be relevant and solve big problems. Especially Rizgar solved this, uh, uh, emphasized this solving big problems. So let's start with Denmark and Silicon Valley. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I uh, founded my first company when I was 16 years old, and, and the current U Noodle is founded five years ago. So I've certainly been through uh, a lot of the hard questions and, and a lot of the doubts. Um, I think uh, what I hear sometimes uh, about when you leave Silicon Valley and, and you see interactions between entrepreneurs and investors, it's very common to have this uh, notion that if you're an entrepreneur and a founder, you complain that, that these guys here just don't get it. You know, they're not like the, the ones that invested in Facebook and everything else. And, and, uh, and in some ways, you blame the fact that you are in a city or a country where there isn't a good fundraising market. And I think, uh, I just want to add to that, that, that it's always hard to raise money. And it's also always hard to build and scale a company. Uh, and, and the thing about, yes, you may be able to get the first 50,000 or 100,000 or some sort of amount to get started off, but, but the really, really hard part is this getting to a product market fit. Like, how do you actually get a product that fits some sort of market where people just can't stop buying it? And what we see in Silicon Valley is, essentially, that hasn't gotten easier. We just see more money thrown at it. So companies go through all these like rounds of investment without actually finding that. They just build traction and build, get more users and, and, and more, more uh, of everything, right? So we have perhaps more money to spend before we get to that point. But it is always hard. And, and there isn't really an, e an, an easy excuse like my investors don't get it. In so many cases do I have uh, entrepreneurs from a lot of different emerging markets and from Europe and other places coming to Silicon Valley and pitching. And they all of a sudden find it really hard to fundraise. So it's not like it's a magical formula. It's, it, it is all about focus. It's all about making sure you build something that somebody really, really wants, is willing to pay for, and have a clear plan on, on, on getting there. Um, I'll probably leave it at that, because I want to hear what you guys yeah, are saying. We have, we have a question related to this topic. Uh, for emerging markets like Kenya and Pakistan, how quickly can startups uh, benefit from hype to, to the real world? How can they grow, uh, is the question to hype to secure more investment. Can you read the last part of the sentence again? For emerging, emerging markets like Kenya and Pakistan, how quickly can startups benefit from the hype to secure more investment? Yasrir Ali. Hype, right? Right, so, how, so how, how, how much can you build on the hype to secure investment? Uh, hype is not a good way to secure investment. <laughs> it's, um, you have to build fundamentals, and I'm gonna pick up, I'm gonna try to address that question by picking up on Torsten's point. From an investor standpoint, I think what I come across the most is lack of focus, um, as he said. I, I mean, I, I cannot count the number of examples where Turkish companies come to me and say, okay, we've just launched a product here and it seems to be going really well and we're gonna go regional, we're gonna conquer the Middle Eastern market. Or there's an Emirati company that says, oh, this is going really well, I'm gonna take over Saudi and I'm gonna take over Egypt and then Morocco is next. And it's like, tell me how many examples you have of Turkish technology companies making it in the Middle East. How many Moroccan companies actually come and make it in Dubai? There aren't that many examples. And one thing that we've learned is being first to market matters much, much less than you think it does. What matters is execution. And so I think as an investor, it's not hype. You really want to look at, you, you want the entrepreneur setting expectations and then delivering expectations and being extremely focused as to how they do that. If they do that, if they stick to their knitting, if they stick to their focus, and if you see an entrepreneur hiring up, if you see someone who's hiring their own replacement, not like, I need a product specialist, let me get a great guy who's been at you know, this other startup, but if they hire someone who could be the replacement CEO, that's where you pay attention. So I think it's really about focus. And Omar, let's conclude. I think it's all been covered, but I, I think one of the key points uh, goes back to choosing the right partner. And I, and I choosing the right partner. Choosing the right partner. And, and it's, it's, there's no formula for that. Um, it, it's driven by chemistry. 
is driven by what the other party brings to the table besides money. Uh, I think take your time because you know once you get into this partnership, it's a very ugly divorce if it, if you don't get along. So it's it's really you know it's it's worth your time to spend time with the uh, with the investor, see that there is a common alignment of goals and strategy and where you want to take this business. You know you may want to take this business to. Dubai, like he's saying, and they say, look, we're not, we're not going to support that. We don't want to do that with you. We can help you do that. So get into those issues right up front with them. Debate these issues and see, you know, is there an alignment? Can you, you know, sit with them and have a meal outside of a, uh, a sort of a management meeting? I think those are very important things and, and, and part of this process of building a partnership. We have a minute. Any closing remarks? Apart from focus, finding the right partner, ecosystem, mobile use set, a lot of optimism, so there is a bright future. Yeah, I think maybe um, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm on this one. <laughs> um, I think I just I, I, I want to share a piece of advice uh, around always under promising and over delivering. And I think that's it's a typical a marketing statement. <laughs> then you <laughs> surprise your customers. But I'm an engineer by training, so I don't know all the the, 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 the marketing, right marketing <laughs> uh, statements. But um, as an entrepreneur, it's definitely a mistake I have done myself over and over again that you know as entrepreneurs we're always uh, very hopeful and positive about about the world and our own companies and we think we have something amazing and we end up kind of conveying that to our investors or potential investors in this like oh I just got this or we're just like, almost here and we almost did this and things always take forever so so think about how you can really make sure you get as much as possible done and then kind of pleasantly surprise the investor as you go along that conversation with, oh yeah this also happened so, so that kind of uh, under-promising and over-delivering, I think, is probably the single Excellent. best thing I can do. Surprising share. pleasantly. This guy? I guess I would say, as, as investors, we have tremendous respect for entrepreneurs who are executing in this region. Um, everywhere, but also in this region. It is really hard to make it here for a whole host of reasons, not just lack of financing. So we have tremendous respect. It is a tough region, and there's also, I think everybody's aware, that solutions to big problems will not come from the government alone. They will come from entrepreneurs. And we spoke a, a lot about, I think, internet and e-commerce, but there are so many areas, in this, in, in, especially in this region, whether that's refugees, whether that's health technologies and health delivery, whether it's bringing education to the masses, whether it's social impact businesses, whether it's clean energy, there are so many things that need to change, and all of them will, or a lot of them will be changed by entrepreneurs, hopefully in this audience. So, Investors are, in, are a conduit to get there, and I truly believe that there's no better time, time than today to do this. Oh I completely agree. I think this is one of the most exciting times to be alive. Uh, you know, I'll just give you a sense. My son is 11, and he's, like, coding, and he wants to set up his own app and stuff. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing, you know, at that age, to have that opportunity uh, to be able to do that. Um, I think my, my parting advice would be think big, guys, you know, because, you know, you know, there's so much opportunity out there. Think big. Um, and then, you know, come to us. We'd love to help, you know, fund you, but you need to get to a late stage. So in order to get to a late stage, you need to think big. So, you know, please think big and figure out how you can scale and accelerate your businesses. Excellent atmosphere, a lot of positive remarks, optimism. So please join me in giving a big round of applause to our panelists and to yourself. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.